a very known and famous scripture John chapter 10 verse 10 and this is a verse that you probably have heard before if you have not brought your bible with you I'm going to read it on the screen if you have you can just flip your bible open and read it with me most of you have this verse already memorized but we'll read it one more time again the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly here is Jesus removes the curtains of the spiritual world and gives us a secret from the world we don't see a spiritual world and this is a very simple secret that there is a thief and there is I and I am not the thief it's very important for people to understand that Jesus did not come to steal kill and destroy Jesus came and actually things were taken from him he was killed and eventually was destroyed for us but he has no interest no desire no record and has no motive to take anything from you and for the record anything you have he has no need of he has no money that he needs of he has no need for the things that we physically have now he loves he wants our heart he wants our life but the things that many people feel like Jesus just wants to take from me well he, if I come to Jesus he'll take my parting from me it's the same thing as a, as a mama will take a uh, a razor from the baby <laughs> she's not taking anything she's preserving a baby's life Jesus has no intention of taking things he came and he says I came if you can put the scripture back I came to give and to give you life more abundantly and Jesus reveals to us that there is Satan and that Satan is real and Satan's strategy is threefold it's very simple he first comes to steal then after he steals he sees that you have not detected him and you have not resisted him and you have not made any changes in your life he goes to the level two to kill something sometimes it could be relationship sometimes it could be health sometimes it could be dreams desires sometimes it could be purity purpose but he seeks to kill something sometimes it could be reputation integrity he seeks to kill something and when he sees that you're not doing anything about the fact that he killed something he goes to level three completely destroy your legacy destroy your eternity and destroy everything or anything that has to do or anyone who comes in contact with your life but his first tactic is to steal a successful thief is somebody who can take something from you without you seeing him the moment you catch a thief that's when he's in trouble I had my sister-in-law a few weeks ago or a month ago in Portland uh, when she was in, uh, in the park somewhere in Portland and somebody broke into the window of her car, took the purse, took everything out of the purse, took the phone and it was gone. She never seen that person on that night and she's never seen that person ever since. We were looking for that person because we have the find me on the iPhone. And I was tracking and I saw when that person logged in into that phone but I couldn't see where that person was. I've never met that person and we could stand here and say that idea that there was a thief who stole your, stole your phone and your credit cards and broke your window that is an illusion that is not true. And to some degree we are right because nobody could see a thief. But when there is something missing in your purse and you didn't lose it through your carelessness you can assume it's the work of a thief Satan's greatest tactic is to do something in your life take something from your life and for him not to be detected and if you do nothing about it he will try to do something with killing and then he will try to do something with destroying but let me encourage you Satan can do nothing in Christian person's life without sin he cannot just come and do it a thief can break through your window a satan cannot just attack you without sin he cannot succeed without sin he needs sin as an open door to do that amen 
and when a person commits sin what they do is they open the door for the devil and then the devil comes in and he first begins to steal things and then when he sees that they're still doing sin he begins to kill things and when the person still continues to do sin he pushes to his last and most final goal and that is to destroy the person's life We've seen a lot of a lot of cases in our own church and you probably have seen where people allow sin in their life and it came first to steal it comes to then to destroy to kill and then it comes to destroy and that's exactly what Jesus tells us the plan of the devil is and he reveals his plan and he said my plan first of all is to give you life and this means to eternal life to give you life if you can go back to the verse he says in here that I have come that they have that they may have life I think it was Derek Prince who is a very famous Bible teacher who has been now with the Lord he said that in the Greek word and he studied Greek I don't know so I reference him he said that word life in this verse means Zoe which is actually the same word that is used for my mother's name Zoya Zoe that word Zoe is the word that describes the very inner life that God has inside of him so the life God has inside of him the eternal life not the life God has around him but the life God, God has inside of him is the very life that Jesus describes in the verse and he says I have come to give you life that means the very life God has inside of him the eternal life so if you're taking notes you can write down that Jesus comes first to give us eternal life. Many people feel like Jesus has come to give me a good life or when people come to Jesus they say well I want Jesus to give me a good life and please understand good life is awesome but not every good life is eternal life. You can get a good life with a good income you can get a good life with a good vacation plan and you can get a good life when you're in high school with the good football skills and with a great, great car and with a great reputation but you can have a good life and have no eternal life but the amazing part about eternal life is it's already good inside eternal life is already good somebody say amen somebody say eternal life is already good and so your aim shouldn't be for good life because it's possible to have a good life that has no eternal life your, your goal is supposed to be to get eternal life which is already good inside because everything inside of God is good and if God is willing to give us that life it is already good and it will spill into our outside life can somebody say amen and so Jesus comes to give us eternal life and we need this life you can get good life on the surface by going to school staying away from bad friends making good decisions coming to church but eternal life can only come from one person and this person is Jesus nobody else can give you eternal life people sometimes have this assumption that if my life gets good that means somehow it is eternal no it is not eternal when it's good but when it's eternal it will become good somebody say amen but Jesus doesn't just in verse 10 of chapter 10 he tells us I have come that they may have life comma <clears throat> and he says the following and he doesn't just come so you will have eternal life just that many people think that's the only reason why Jesus came is to give us the eternal life but Jesus adds something just like Satan doesn't come only to steal he has few more levels that he wants to go into Jesus says I have one more step I want to pursue with you and he adds this he says that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly now you may say how can I have it more eternal life if it's eternal that means forever how can I have more of forever you can't once it's forever it's forever but I believe Jesus is talking about something else here that he also comes to give us abundant life Jesus doesn't just come to give me eternal life which means I will live forever but Jesus comes to give me abundant life what is 
this life that is abundant. Does it mean gold, girls and glory, possessions, fame, influence, every dream of yours becomes a reality? Well some of us know that some of these things actually if we speak very honestly can be achieved without Jesus. What is something Jesus gives that is abundant that nobody else can? Or if we can paraphrase the question. What is something in the abundant life Jesus gives that everything we acquire cannot compete with? Eternal life is not possible without Jesus. Abundant life is not possible without the Holy Spirit. If you're taking this notes, write this down. Eternal life is not possible without Jesus. And the abundant life is not possible without the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes first of all to give us salvation eternal life and then he puts comma and he says when you receive eternal life I want to give you abundant life I want the rest of your life on this earth not just to be thinking about heaven but I want this life on this earth to be more abundant is it just so it will be full of miracles see it's possible to have one miracle and not have an abundant life but when the Holy Spirit who is the center of abundant life is present miracles are not just once they are something that becomes a lifestyle the center of eternal life is Jesus Christ and the center of abundant life is the Holy Spirit the life of disciples was drastically changed when they met Jesus as their Savior. Their whole world was completely changed. Their jobs were changed. Their view was changed. They experienced things. They heard things. And they, when Jesus looked to these disciples and few guys left and Jesus says, are you guys wanting to leave? And they said, no master, we have heard the words of life from you. And it was so fantastic. The world was left unchanged. When Jesus leaves to heaven and he is saying to them, you have received this eternal life because you believed in me, your life is about to go to completely another level. Because the Holy Spirit will take my place in your life. He will come and then your life will be completely different. And that's exactly what also happens to us as Christians. As Christians we have the Holy Spirit but as Christians we also can be in the place where we don't know the Holy Spirit whom we have. We can be in the place where the Holy Spirit that we have legally we don't know relationally. Like I mentioned many times I have two roommates that live in my basement and um, one of them comes to our church and another one um, I only know her name but not much. She's legally there. I see her once in a while. She sees me but we don't have a relationship. And the person like Martin, like uh, uh, Sulamita, like Ilya, I know them personally. We are friends. We are in a relationship. With them though they live in my house we are not in a relationship. We are not friends and Holy Spirit for some people he could be simply he is God he lives in my heart or he could be someone you are in a close relationship with if Jesus is your Savior you get eternal life if Holy Spirit is your friend only then your life will become abundant you can have that abundant life driving a bus to church you can have that abundant life being single. You can have that abundant life not even maybe not seeing any miracles right now but only for a short time. That abundant life, the center of this abundant life is not miracles. It's a person of the Holy Spirit 
who produces miracles and this life is what I want to talk to you for a few minutes this life is real Jesus didn't come to give us religion he came to give us eternal life and to give us abundant life that abundant life exists in the person of the Holy Spirit when you hear the testimonies today and there will be thousands and thousands of testimonies that will be happening here all of this is happening is because we as young people are tapping not only into the fact that we are saved by Jesus but in the fact that Jesus also gave us one more precious gift as important as our salvation this gift is God himself the Holy Spirit Jesus is the Lamb of God who gives us eternal life but John the Baptist said he is also the baptizer of the Holy Spirit and many people only know Jesus on the cross who dies for their sin but they don't know Jesus sitting in heaven and who baptizes people in the Holy Spirit Jesus is, did not stay at the cross if you go to Jerusalem you will find no Jesus at the cross till this day Jesus is in heaven and his job every day on this earth is also baptizing people means introducing them to the person he left on this earth the Holy Spirit the secret to your abundant life and for your Christian life to change is not another conference it's not even another book it's to discover the person who lives inside of you the Holy Spirit I'm not talking about you I'm talking about the Holy Spirit amen let's briefly just mention a little bit the keys to this abundant life you have to make a decision to be with the Holy Spirit forever why is that important because when a person begins to have a relationship with God the Holy Spirit many people have the relationship as some of you have jobs right now in the mall seasonal and when the new year's is over you lose that job and for many people they start a relationship with the Holy Spirit but only for a short time it's only because I'm single and I don't have a lot of um, things to do and I have uh, just nothing to do for some people the relationship with God is only because they're going through something really difficult and really challenging right now that relationship will never lead you to abundant life it's a one-night stand it's not gonna work God the Father sent the Holy Spirit to be on this earth not until we make a mistake but Jesus said the Holy Spirit is coming on this earth to be with us forever God is a very great God and he knows things he has seen that we will make mistakes he has calculated and put into perspective the fact that we will probably ignore him that we are probably not going to be the best companions for the Holy Spirit he could find yet he still made a commitment the Holy Spirit is not leaving the earth until the church is leaving the earth he is sticking with you guys forever Amen. that means this does something to us lets me know he is not gonna leave me but the Holy Spirit needs to know from you that you are making a conscious decision you're not leaving him when you get tired when you get weak when you it's hard when you find in yourself in doubt when you make a mistake when things get really rough and tough in life or when things get really 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 good in life there is one person you are till death do us apart and this is the person God the Father said is gonna be with me forever the Holy Spirit until you make the decision in your heart it's a conscious decision I'm going into a relationship with the Holy Spirit and I'm not going back your relationship with God will always struggle will always struggle because the enemy will see the fact that your consistency with God only depends on a temporary situation and he will use that against you when things get hard he will knock you out or when things get good he will say well you already got everything you needed now you can stop that is not how your abundant life happens abundant life happens with a conscious decision me and the Holy Spirit is for life this is not a new revelation that I am on this is not a new thing that I am in no the Holy Spirit is with me till I die and I am going to be with him till I die also can somebody say amen the key number two is that to make room in our day make room for the Holy Spirit in your schedule 
make room in your schedule for the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit comes to us to live in us and God sent him to us, we must make room for him in our schedule. What does that mean? That means that you have to have time throughout your day where you open this Bible and you read it. And after you finish reading it, you must understand this Bible was written not by John, but through John, not by Job, but through Job, not by Moses, but through Moses, but it was actually authored by the Holy Spirit. So you are writing letter, who, if you read a book, Purpose Driven Life, it's written by Rick Warren. If you're reading Bible, it's written by the Holy Spirit. It's written through different men, but it's written by one person, the Holy Spirit. So you are reading initially his writing. And when you finish reading the scriptures, you must have a moment in your time during the day where you don't just go through your prayers, through your chores, God bless me, God protect me, my job, my bless my future husband, you know, bless my future kids, my house, my, oh, and you pray everything in the name of Jesus, amen. But you have to have a moment where you consciously, sometimes you need to close your eyes, when you consciously understand that in this room right now, there is God, the Holy Spirit. And when you begin to just just your thought that he is here and then you begin to talk to him holy spirit i welcome you holy spirit i love you holy spirit help me to understand this bible fill me with your presence and you begin to imagine him as a person see for some of us it's hard to imagine him as a person for one reason because the word spirit kind of throws us off and because Jesus we imagine Jesus a, a long beard a Jewish blue eyes man and long robe so when you see Jesus it's easy for you to connect that Jesus is a person when I when I say Heavenly Father you immediately imagine big Santa Claus like big awesome lovely daddy who just loves all of his kids and so it's easy for you because you see father figure you see Jesus and when we think of the spirit most of our mind immediately goes into a dove force wind fire or oil because to us a spirit is somehow just just kind of this blur this kind of not certain nothing concrete let me help you this is what helps me all the time just one one illustration always helps me when my mind starts going into like weird zone and I always remind myself when I'm going to be dead and all of my body is going to be in the casket all of my body is going to be there all of me is going to be there and none of me is going to be there. How Vlad is not what I see in the mirror. Vlad is what nobody sees. It's on inside. The real me is not the body. The real me is the person, not the body, but inside of the body. And so anytime I begin to pray and I imagine the Holy Spirit is a person and I remember one particular time I was like, Lord, wouldn't you, wouldn't it be easier for us if you Holy Spirit would also have like a physical body? And I felt like Holy Spirit answered that prayer to me and he says, I do have it. It's your body. I've chosen your body. And I said, God, but I, maybe some body, body would have been better, <laughs> would have been easier to relate. But he has chosen your body so when you spend time with him see him as a person and don't let the fact he doesn't have a body confuse you because he has chosen your body can somebody say amen uh, number three number three key is that we have to obey the holy spirit when he speaks our relationship with the holy spirit cannot really go further than our obedience to him you can start to have a fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You can start reading the scriptures and you can start talking to the Holy Spirit. And you can start experiencing His presence. And when that will happen, your ab abundant life will begin to bubble up. But it gets stuck on the level where you get stuck with obedience. Many people start their relationship with the Holy Spirit or start their relationship with God. And they're like, I feel like I hit a plateau. I feel like it's it's stuck and usually I have one question where did you got stuck where he asked you something and you said not really not now too hard too ridiculous too crazy I can't do this this is too much not for me I gotta have to take a pause anytime you plateau in your obedience you plateau in your relationship 
Holy Spirit loves everyone the same but he trusts everyone different. His love for us depends on the fact Jesus obeyed the Father on the cross. His trust in us depends on the fact we obey him. Jesus died on a cross that's why God the Father loves everyone the same he loves me the same way he loves Annie he loves Annie the same way he loves Larissa the same way he loves Yesenia the same way he loves Olesa and loves every person in this room but the Holy Spirit will trust each one of us differently based on one criteria our obedience and you may say well that's not fair well if we actually be very honest you also trust people based on this criteria you love people the same well I hope you do I hope we do your parents loved all of your children the same but if you had more than one sibling I'm sure of one thing your parents did not trust all of you the same some of you your parents will never trust you with their car he would never trust you with your credit card with their credit card he would trust you with nothing just because of one thing not because you're ugly bad and not spiritual just because of one thing you're not obedient they love you but just can't trust you Holy Spirit wants to trust you more and remember your relationship with him only hits a plateau if you choose to plateau in your level of obedience sometimes obedience is hard like getting baptized it's very hard for those who are not sometimes obedience is hard for those who know they need to make a step and come to the front and give their lives to Jesus like Annie was sharing for somebody like me sitting I'm like oh man why is this so hard but it's because I'm not in her shoes sometimes obedience to the Holy Spirit is hard when he asks you to go to that person that you held grudge against and you curse them you cussed them you even posted things on Facebook about them and to admit to them you were a jerk and you made a mistake that is hard sometimes you stole something from somewhere and you pray to the Lord and you feel like Holy Spirit wants you to go and tell them what you stole and you know you will have to pay it back next three months of salary is gonna have to go there and that is really hard and sometimes the Holy Spirit will lead you I know what I'm, what I'm talking about when the Lord will lead you just place it on your heart confirm it with God's Word to do certain things I remember when last year I felt like my relationship with the Holy Spirit plateaued it was on my way to California, Sacramento, listening to uh, messages uh, by this person that I respect and love. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, God, there has to be more. I love traveling. I love going to other places. I see people saved. I meet people who get touched by our ministry. But God, I just want to see, I want to see miracles. I want to see my own spiritual life to go to another level. I want, I know there's more. And as I am thinking about the fact that I felt like I plateaued, another thought comes into this head talk to your wife and the amount of money that you guys saved to put it as a deposit for your new house give that money away and let me take your heart and just fill it with my power I was like Lord can, can there be any other way you can fill my heart with your power <laughs> I'm not sure I like the idea of doing this you know what made me pushed me to do that is the fact I wanted to go to another level with God so bad I was willing to pay any price and I come back to my wife and I said babe honestly it does not really matter I'm like our life first has to prosper spiritually I'm like I feel like we are prospering financially a lot faster than we are prospering spiritually I feel like spiritually I'm kind of stuck on this level and financially I'm going forward so I'm like let's just take some of the progress from here and dump it over here to see our spiritual life just kick it a little bit harder and a little bit more and I could tell you honestly that my life from that point is shifted and something happened again this year some of you know we're in the, in the process right now um, building a house and there was this at this point I really felt like you know I needed a lot of money just needed things and, and this and that and and another level came in where I felt like for next year I want my relationship with the Holy Spirit and I want to see 50 liters and one particular time when we came from Ukraine and my car was parked somewhere else's driveway and I drove by it was two o'clock in the morning I just felt this just this in my heart I can't explain it how I knew it was from the from the scriptures also not to take my car but to leave it there in the driveway and to give it away something I've never done before in my life but I felt like this 
will be a key for me to go to another level spiritually. I am not saying in any way you can buy your relationship with God with giving money to somebody. No, but you cannot go to another level if you don't go to another level in obedience. For some people obedience is not to go to a club this weekend. For some people obedience is not to sleep with your girlfriend. For some people's obedience is to marry your girlfriend. For some people obedience is actually to sign up and get baptized. For some people obedience is finally to open the Bible. Some people's obedience may be actually to start giving 10%. For some people's obedience may be to give five dollars. For some people's obedience is to apologize to your mom or to your dad. For some people's obedience is actually to reach out to somebody who God has been putting on your heart. Whatever your level of obedience is, remember this. If you want to go deeper, it's only through obedience. If you want to get stuck in one area, don't obey. You will only go as far as you obey. Can somebody say amen? amen. And let's finish this on the last point, the fourth. Come back to the Holy Spirit when you fall. You have to make a conscious decision in the beginning from early days is that when you make a mistake that you come back to God. That you come back to God. We have a school here and if you go in that school you will find something very interesting there and almost every single hall they have this thing called emergency maps where in case of fire they all know where to go and they have these drills once a month I think there was one today where this, they sound the alarm and it's actually not real fire there's no fire trucks coming but all the kids follow the map and they all exit they prepare for in case of emergency where to go they don't want to go anywhere in case of fire they only want to go to a certain place where they will be safe from the fire each Christian must have an emergency map in their mind in case they make a mistake the emergency map has to be this if I make a mistake I don't run from God I run to God if I stumble, if I fall, I don't run from the Holy Spirit, I run to the Holy Spirit. You have to make that before you fall and most of you won't fall. But in case you do, we are people who live in the flesh. We are people who live in a sinful world and we make mistakes and some of our mistakes are as hard as saying an, a cuss word. For some of us mistakes, some of our mistakes are as bad as stealing a gum or, or saying something gossiping or saying something negative. For some people's mistakes is to simply have an evil thought or something that they've said or something that they've done. But you must understand Holy Spirit knows you are going to make mistakes along your line. He did not chose Gabriel and Michael. He has chosen you, the Hispanic, the Russian, the American. He has chosen you and he knows your capabilities to make mistakes are awesome. And when you make a mistake, you have to make up your mind. That at that point, God knew I am capable of doing that and he still let me have the Holy Spirit. And if I go back to God, he will give me mercy. But if I stay in my mistake and think that now I am not worthy to God, now I am not good enough to God, now God has no need for people like me who slip and slop and flop, but God only wants those perfect ones whom you don't know who they really are. That in that point what happens to you is that you're there and this is what you're saying is I am gonna get cleaned up a little bit and when I look better I am gonna make my way to God. Have you ever tried to clean a dirty dish with a dirty rag? It never works. Ask Judas. You know what Judas thought? I betrayed Jesus, took the money that he treated, betrayed Jesus with, came to Pharisees, threw the money and he says, I'm going to make it right. I'm going to give all the money away. It didn't work. It didn't work anytime instead of coming to God you're trying to clean it up it only you're only going deeper deeper and deeper there is nothing that can cleanse you except the blood of Jesus Christ and the love of the Father <laughs> nothing I am not excusing a lifestyle of sin but I'm trying to encourage each one of you in order to have a lasting relationship with the Holy Spirit you have to have a map emergency map in your back of your mind if I make a mistake I am not dropping the whole thing I am not gonna lead to another sin no I am gonna get up and go to my father and I will say to my father my father I have sinned against you and the heaven 
And the father is not going to slap me. And the father is not going to call police on me. And the father will embrace me. And I will never be the same as a person. There was a time Jesus was eating. And the Bible says that as he was eating among dignified people. And one very sinful woman came. And the, when a woman was sinful in the Bible, it indicates the fact that she was immoral. Now imagine yourself sitting in the room and you're a man and you're son of God. You're sitting amongst other men and here is a woman whose reputation is to seduce men and to have immoral things with them. And sh this woman comes and without any shame, without any ethics in her mind, she approaches Jesus and instead of getting on her knees and saying, Jesus, I'm sorry, please forgive me of all my sins. She doesn't do that. She starts to touch his feet, an immoral woman touching the feet of a man. Immediately everybody around said, she's trying to seduce him. This is happening right in front of our nose and this man has no idea who's trying to touch him. And I, I believe, you know, I wouldn't feel comfortable if you're sitting and somebody is touching your feet and especially a woman who has this kind of a reputation and you're in front of other men. And this was the moment for Jesus to save his reputation and to say, hey, um, tomorrow, please, please. I, I know, I know about the past. I know about all of the men and I know what happened last night. Please get your hands off of my feet. You're embarrassing me you know what Jesus did he let her touch him dirty hands clean feet he knew the only way this woman will get clean is if it touches something clean and that what she touched was so clean it made every stain every shame and every guilt leave like stain that leaves you when you take shower And Jesus once for all settled the fact he cares little about his reputation and he cares so much about you. And that's why when you make a mistake you have to know there is somebody in heaven who cared little about his reputation in front of his bodies because he cared about your cleansing and he cared about restoring your heart and restoring your life. You can never make yourself clean by yourself. You can only make yourself clean by touching the feet of somebody who is. That somebody is Jesus. You must understand when you feel like you deserve God's love the least it's when you need it the most when you need it the most make a decision when you make a mistake the next day you will be first person to tell the Holy Spirit I'm sorry I'm a jerk please change me I don't want to do that again don't let Satan get to God before you and don't lay in your sin too long because remember you got some demons from your past are still trying to catch up and the longer you lay the more time they got to get to you when you fall get up and say Jesus help me and he will help you nobody who walks with God for a long time walks with God for a long time because they don't make mistakes if you talk to every person who walks with God and who has abundant life, they'll tell you one thing. It's not that they learn to make less mistakes. It's that they learned to stay less in their mistakes. And as a result, they made them so much less. The only way to make less mistakes in life is first to know. Stay less in your mistakes. Get up. Sometimes when you do something wrong, it's so easy to do something wrong again. The, fr the first right thing you can do after you did something wrong is to run to God. I remember meeting a young man in Vancouver who told me how he slid back to drugs and drinking and to uh, sexual immorality. And he said, Vlad, it only happened because of one thing. He says, after this particular camp, I got so touched by God and I made a decision. I knew I will never ever sin again. And I was like wow and the moment he said that I knew what's going to come next because anytime young people are become so confident we must understand we can't do it without God and he said two months later he said I don't know how it happened but I just slipped. He said it was just a small thing 
but he says after that slip I did not know how to deal with myself I felt like I cannot come bring myself to God no more when I disappointed him like that and so he said guess what happened instead of going back to God you know what I did I went back into heavier drinking heavier drinking until he says my past not only returned in full force it returned double and I stayed I got so deep into the sins of my past and it all started with one thing when I got fire in my building I could not find an emergency map I thought I don't need an emergency map fires will never happen in this building my friends we all fall you need an emergency map and that map is the road to Calvary if you can't walk there crawl if you can't crawl call some people in your home group and say I'm so down I can't get up because you come and pray for me and God will send you four people who did it to the paralyzed man who will pick you up and drag you to Jesus and when Jesus will touch you you will give high five to your friends and you say now I can walk again and somebody say amen but don't ever stay in your pit don't ever stay in your shame don't ever stay in your past do whatever it takes walk run crawl or ask somebody to help you carry you but don't stay there because if you're staying there the devil is getting closer and the Holy Spirit is getting further and further not because he doesn't love you but because he wants to teach you get up I love you I will help you I will free you I will deliver you and I still care about you and you're not worthless this fourth step it took me a while you know I'm not here I don't have any big sins to confess but it took me a while to make the decision because that's where my relationship with God struggled not that I wouldn't pray but it just I just had this deep distance and and after a while ago there was this decision in one particular prayer after hearing some teachings it really changed my mind that I have to make a decision no matter what happens I'm going to be back with God I'm gonna be like David. David did some, well I'm not gonna be like David in that sense. <laughs> David, David did some really bad things. I'm not gonna be like David, I'm sorry. But when we make a mistake and the Holy Spirit was about to withdraw, David says, God please don't take the Holy Spirit from me. You know why David said that? Because David saw what happened to the king before him, Saul. When he made a mistake, he made excuses, he never apologized and the Holy Spirit started to withdraw and Saul instead of saying, Holy Spirit please, please, we, we can make this right, I really love you, I need you. Saul held on to his throne and for next 20 years chased David like a madman. I wonder what would happen if Saul would have chased the Holy Spirit for 20 years like he chased David. He would have never committed suicide. No wonder the Bible says demons came into Saul's life. Anytime you stay in your mistakes it's a matter of time and you're gonna have some vultures, you can have some demonic thoughts, you're gonna have some demons saying you're worthless, you're nobody, you're never gonna make it, God doesn't love you, it's over for you, you should just quit, you should just stop, never ever nothing works out for you and you will hear these voices and you know what's gonna happen next? What happened to Judas? Satan comes to steal, kill and destroy. Just get up moment you will start getting up you will feel the strong arm of the Holy Spirit pulling you up. Ask Peter he was drowning when he tried to walk and he started to fall and he said Jesus help me right there Jesus was there to pick him up. Jesus will never slap you push it away and says you try harder you swim first to me. No that's not our Jesus. He knows our only hope 